So our speaker tonight is Professor Malcolm Horn, um, who I'm sure is known to many of you. Uh, Mal's a consultant neurologist at St. Vincent's um, Hospital and is an honorary professor uh, here at the Flory, and he has a number of other appointments up there on the screen. Um, his clinical interest has been in movement disorders, and I was just having a conversation with him. He's um, also becoming more interested in um, ataxia. Um, but especially his um, expertise is in Parkinson's disease. So his research has related to the underlying biological factors of Parkinson's disease, and in the um, last five to 10 years has really been concentrating on how to get clinicians to better treat the symptoms of the disease. Um, as I said, Mal has presented many of these lectures over the years, um, and he recently went into retirement from the speaking circuit, um, but much like John Farnham, we can't keep him away, uh, and he's back for what he assures me is one last lecture, but we'll see about that. Um, so please join me in welcoming Professor Malcolm Horn. Thank you very much, Tom, and commiserations to you all. I'm back. So, uh, I'm, so tonight's lecture is a um, somewhat, in some ways, a dry topic, but some, it's very central to what we do in science. And um, I probably should just also um, point out that um, in the interests of full exposure, I actually have a consultancy with the topic that we're going to talk about. But. Um, um, it's, the reason that that's relevant, though, is that this is a conversation or a talk about taking a discovery that uh, occurred in, or a process that occurred in my laboratory, and actually taking it forward to uh, use in the clinical arena in a routine process in clinical care. And so you have to begin with an idea, and that then has to go through a process which leads to the uh, does it work? That is the proof of concept. Can it actually do what you thought it would do? But that's really just the beginning because after that, you then have to turn it into a product. And the idea that what that means is that when we are working with the lab, we have wires and bits of gadget everywhere. And it's a very idealized circumstance. But we need to be able to produce it into a product that can actually be um, reliable, easy to use and fits into the everyday workings of what patients do and what uh, the uh, clinic does. And that's a very different setting to what happens in the laboratory. And finally, and this is really the topic of tonight's talk, is that it's around asking, does it improve quality of life and or does it save money for the people who pay for it? And by the people who pay for it, we mean your taxes at work. And that's really the issue that we're going to talk about today. Now, this is the science. This is what happens in this building every day. And this is what's called translational research, which is taking that scientific product and turning it into a, or that scientific idea and turning it into a product that actually doctors are using on their daily basis. And this has taken us 30 years get from here. It began in 1990 and uh, it's sort of hopefully getting to a stage now where we can say it really is a product. And I'm really going to focus on this little bit of it. If we've got some time, we might get back to there later on. So I have to start, first of all, explaining to you what the broad idea and what the background to this process is. So I'm going to use an idea which is really blood pressure to actually illustrate what the story is. And that is that medicine, everything we do in medicine depends on measuring something. And so with blood pressure, it first began with this gentleman who was a clergyman, but this fellow here, von Bach, was the person who first invented that machine that you get measured by when you go to the doctors. But the thing is, measurement doesn't actually do anything unless you're going to lead to a doctor making a decision to actually use their medication or a therapy of some sort. So even though he discovered this in 1881, it wasn't until this time when President Franklin Roosevelt went for his normal medical checkup, it was found to be 
blood pressure of 220 over 120. Now, you may not know, but that's very, very high. <laughs> but he was given a clean bill of health. But he died with a hemorrhage, hemorrhagic stroke, two months later. So what that illustrates is that people weren't really clear that blood pressure and stroke were that well linked. His um, uh, successor, President Truman, instituted after that the National Heart Act and created the path for studying of heart disease because there was this inkling that something had gone wrong here. And this led to the idea that uh, the studies afterward that hypertension was associated with stroke, heart failure and heart attacks. We are getting to Parkinson's. And risk was higher with blood pressure. But it wasn't until 1967, which is a long time after von Busch, that the incidence of stroke could be lowered when blood pressure was lowered. So the link between the measurement and the change in people's outcome was demonstrated. And this could only be done because drugs became available for lowering blood pressure. So then, then finally, that led to where we are now, where we have targets. That is, we measure the blood pressure so that we can treat to bring your blood pressure down into the proper range because we know that this leads to an improved outcome. So that set of links, which is that a measured indice such as blood pressure or glucose for diabetes or cholesterol for lipidemia is associated with a worst outcome and that there is a treatment that controls that outcome and that lowering that marker using that treatment improves outcome and that there is a target that can tell us whether we, your level is high or low. This is a fundamental idea in, Park, in medicine. But in Parkinson's, what's the story? Well, we do have an indices called bradykinesia. That's the slowness of movement that exists in Parkinson's. It's the cardinal sign that leads to the diagnosis. It's not the tremor, but it's the slowness of the movement that can be the thing that makes it hard to do up the buttons, that hard to do the walking, the, the motions, etc. That's associated with a worst outcome. Now, don't read the fine print. This is just simply to say there's a lot of publications that show that there's a reduction in quality of life if your bradykinesia is bad. So we know that bradykinesia is not good for you, but that's where the problem arises because while we have a treatment, so we, we, we know that there's a measurable indices, bradykinesia, and we have treatments that are designed to improve bradykinesia. They're levodopa, deep brain stimulation, duodopa, cifrol. And these have been around for a long, long time. These drugs were introduced in 1960s and levodopa has just had its 50th birthday. So it's been around with us for a long, long time. So we're a little bit different from high blood pressure because we have all of these things, but we don't really have a good way of measuring bradykinesia to tell whether it's high or low. So we don't know if lowering it into a target range is going to be good for you or not. And we don't have targets. So that's the dilemma that we were in about three or four years ago. So that's the question that I'm wanting to talk about today is what happens when we introduce a measurement for Parkinson's disease. So the old fashioned crude measurement, which is when a doctor got you to do all of these things and move your hand backwards and forwards, we'll call that over here. The problem for us is that, or for all of us, patients and doctors, is that when you turn up to the doctor, your score might be there. The problem for a patient is if they're taking medications at 9 o'clock and 12 o'clock and sometime here throughout the day and you turn up here, it's all very well if you're constant throughout the whole day. You're not varying at all. But as we all know, people with Parkinson's don't do that. They're up and down all the time depending on whether their medications is there. So the challenge is for 
the patient and the doctor to be able to explain to each other or understand from each other how representative this time when you actually walk in the consultancy and remember it might be the one time they're in there for the next four months, how that relates to your fluctuations over the course of the day. Can you provide the history to tell you how that varies and what is off? What we mean by that is when is it that the medications aren't working? That's what off means. And is that below a target? Is that is when you say you're off the same as when somebody else says they're off? And what severity should be treated because you feel you're off? Is that bad enough to be treated or should we have been treating it ages ago before it was realised? So the problem with all of this is can the person with Parkinson's provide an accurate history? Well, regrettably no. And there's several reasons for that and it's not the patient's fault. It's as much to do with doctors and men and the disease itself. Firstly, language. How do you tell someone that you actually have bradykinesia? Because for me, bradykinesia is very clear. It talks about these slowness of movements, but patients don't talk about bradykinesia. They have other feelings when the medications don't work that can be that they're tired, that they've got pain, that they can't think clearly. There's all sorts of other things, that, words that they use, so we have a linguistic problem about communicating. And the second problem is that bradykinesia actually is a surrogate, slowness, it's a surrogate. It's a surrogate for actually not enough dopamine in the brain and that leads to a whole lot of other symptoms which are not just slowness and for some people those other symptoms are more important than the slowness itself. There's also a problem that everybody has about awareness and recall. We're actually much better at remembering what just happened than what had happened a while ago. And if you've ever had to fill in a diary and tell someone about what your dietary habits are, it's easy enough to remember what you had for breakfast this morning, but it's pretty hard to remember what you had for tea four days ago. And so keeping that pattern is very difficult to recall. That's why diaries are hopeless for working out for advertisers with television and they've forgotten, they've gone, stopped doing them long ago. Another big problem is that the whole purpose of the region of the brain that's affected in Parkinson's disease is to make things automatic so that you don't have to think about them. So here we are asking you to think about things, these movements which have just become automatic. Now there's two examples I'm going to use to explain this. Any of you who play golf will know that it's very hard to know whether your golf shot has gone wrong. All you know is that you end up in the rough, but you can't actually explain why is it that that golf is shot isn't working anymore. And that's because it's an automatic process that has been determined by the part of the brain that gets affected by Parkinson's. Those of you who have been to lectures that I've given before will know that I talk about the process of learning to drive a car. When you first learn to drive a car, you're busy paying attention to getting the, gates, the brakes and the gears and the clutch and everything to work together. And you can't really pay attention to who you're driving into around or over. And it's only when those processes become automatic that you can then start driving a car. And I'm sure all of you have had the uh, experience of driving home and actually not realise, not, can't remember some of the events that you did when you were driving home because it was so automatic. And we're asking, that's because that's all done by the region of Parkinson's, that's affected in Parkinson's and when you'll get Parkinson's we're asking you to now be more aware of those movements even though they're automatic. And finally, Parkinson's affects people's cognition. So that means the effect of that is that people are much more aware with Parkinson's of the immediacy of what's going on and tend to overrate it more than they did with events that happened a little while ago. So if you're off now, it's really bad. But if you've got dyskinesia now, you're also going to rate it as nearly really bad. And so it's not, you're not nearly as good as perhaps people without Parkinson's in terms of rating 
the severity of things now compared with what they were. For all of those reasons, it means that people with Parkinson's find it much harder to tell a doctor or a doctor finds it hard to get the information from the patient about how things have been going. So the way we've addressed this is to develop a system for trying to measure these movements as accurately as we can over the course of the day and relate it to the timing of medications. And the system is this has three components. It's got this watch, which you can wear on your witch, wrist, and it collects the data systematically over a period of about um, six to seven days. And we've worked out that you need to wear it for that length of time to get a systematic pattern because people's ex um, activities vary sufficiently to actually get this pattern, you need to be going that long, particularly if dyskinesia is present. The second key component, and this is where most of the invention went on, was developing algorithms for bradykinesia and dyskinesia to produce scores every two minutes. And the third thing, which is really an important component, is to present all of this data that we've collected back to the clinician in a way that the clinician intuitively understands to be able to make therapeutic decisions. And that's what we call the PKG. And if you wonder why the PKG, well, it's a little bit like the same nomenclature as an ECG. That's the machine for collecting the data for the ECG. This is the way of working out the data and the ECG is presented in a graph for the clinician to use. So this is an example of the sort of things that we get. Is This is the time of day and this is the score for the bradykinesia and the dyskinesia and the worst dyskinesia going north up here, don't worry about the severity scale, just believe me it gets worse and the bradykinesia getting worse this way. And so this blue line is this person's bradykinesia score. So it was worse in the morning, and when it gets up to here, it's about the same level as someone who hasn't got Parkinson's. These red lines are when the medications are due. So you can see that after this medication, the scores improved and they nearly got back to normal and they stayed there for about two hours. And then they wore off so the bradykinesia got worse again, and then it improves again after the next dose, stays good for a longer period of time, wears off, and this is what we call wearing off, a longer response this time, and then comes good again in this repeating pattern. Don't worry about what these other lines will come, that's sort of a, another detail, we can discuss them if you like. But the important point that there's this fluctuating course of this person getting good to their medications and wearing off in a quite clear pattern. The other thing which I'm going to talk about later on in this pink range is what we have come to define as the target. That means that if your bradykinesia score is above here, in this range or below actually, but in this range here, then it's okay. It's like having blood pressure scores that are, they're not quite right, but they're good enough that you don't really need to have it treated and that quality of life is better if you're here than you're out here. So this person is outside of target, in target, outside of target, back in target. So what did he tell us? Well, he was 62, he'd had Parkinson's for four years and as far as he was concerned, Parkinson's was pretty good. He, he was thinking about um, retiring because he was getting tired. But when I always ask people about, do you, you know, do you run out of petrol? Do things getting a bit tired before the next dose? You're getting a bit weary? And he said, no, none of that. All I do is I just get tired throughout the day. But his wife said, no, I can tell when your medications are due. So we had a discussion as to whether we're going to treat the wife or treat him. <laughs> and we agreed to change his medications. And the outcome was that um, now his score was mainly in the target. So that was good. But what had we done here? We'd made his dyskinesia worse. And so he was much happier because he felt that he wasn't getting tired anymore and he didn't, wasn't too much troubled by this. 
but this pattern is one that we know is going to need soon advanced therapies. So we had a discussion about this advanced therapies, we mean DBS or duodopa or things like that. So this is something, a discussion that wouldn't have come about without actually having advanced therapy. <coughs> I'm just going to give you another example now of a 73-year-old retired lawyer who'd had 15 years of Parkinson's and a much more complicated story. And he came for a second opinion because he felt that his Parkinson's wasn't any good, but he was having trouble explaining why it wasn't very good. And medications were not lasting long enough. He was unable to provide a clear history of timing of off periods, except that he knew that he got tremors unpredictably. And leave, it took levodopa whenever he had off periods. He was a bit haphazard about taking his medication consumptions because he didn't think they worked very reliably. He had Parkinson's symptoms on waking in the early morning about two, two o'clock. And he, when I saw him, he had modest truncal and distal dyskinesia. Don't worry about those numbers. And I did wonder whether there were some questions around just whether he was really clear in his comprehension and understanding. So what we decided to do, because he was taking his medications really in a, all over the shop, was to take these medications in a very clear reminder time and he told me when and we programmed them into the watch and he was not to take any other medications other than just when the watch told him to. And so we got this pattern which was yes indeed his Parkinson's was off in the morning and the medications worked in about 45 minutes and he had a good period and then it wore off and it wasn't a very low wearing off. And I actually should hit this here so early morning off and then he had wearing off for one hour before the next dose and that was fairly predictable. There looked like there was a bit of a lag in this response, but this one didn't seem to work at all. And so he was not entirely clear about that, but he did say that he was better by taking his medication on time. And when we looked into the daily pattern, and I'm just going to mark the tremor here as these black lines whenever there was tremor present and I'm using the tremor just to help people understand that in his, whenever he got, whenever his medications failed, he got a tremor. And it's just a good pictorial representation. So if we look at his days, you can see that when he took his medications, the medications disappeared on every day except this one. So he was right, the medications didn't always work, even though on average, they did. And then the medications wore off but with a variable period of time and the next one worked promptly sometimes but not at other times. And by the time we got here we had one, some days where the medications hardly worked at all whereas on other days they worked quite promptly. And then over here it was very good but other times he needed to take them. Now what was going on here? Well the problem here is this is the classic example where the gut isn't absorbing the medications properly. They're not transiting from the stomach into the intestines. And this is the classic picture of someone who needs to have duodopa. Now, I'm putting this up here not as an advertisement for duodopa, but to explain the difficulty that this patient has explaining what they go on. Unless you can measure it, it wouldn't be possible to get this story out he was an intelligent man, but very clear, clearly a difficult problem to enunciate. And so it really would, was very difficult to extract this story without some measurement to help. He also had a lot of trouble at night. These black dots is when he was sleeping. So you can see he didn't go to bed till midnight, but he had a lot of times awake. And they really were awake because when we look at his tremor score, and tremor only appears in Parkinson's when you're awake. And you can see that he really wasn't having a very good time sleeping and this was probably affecting his cognition. So it really was possible then to start talking about how to manage the night time to help the daytime. So just to use his an example, the levodopa lasted less than four hours. There's variable absorption, especially after midday and he had poor sleep. 
when we shortened the time to three hourly, on average, he was doing a whole lot better. But as we saw from the graph, he was still having variable responses and had poor absorption. And so we gave him a long, long acting drug and recommended duodopa. We can now say we have a measurement for bradykinesia, but what we don't know at this stage, when we got to this point, is if lowering targets, indices, the things we're measuring, bradykinesia improves outcome, and we didn't have targets. So we produced these targets here by doing what everybody's done with blood pressure and cholesterol is we go and say, well, what happens to people who haven't got Parkinson's? Well, this is the 75th percentile of people without Parkinson's. And I was speaking to a gentleman before who was willing to, who hasn't got Parkinson. He was a volunteer and wore this. And we did this on a large number of people to produce these normal ranges. And it's a score. We use this as a score that most doctors treat Parkinson's at diagnosis. So that was another clue that said, well, this wouldn't be a bad place to start as a target. It's a score that tremor disappears as it did in this gentleman, the other gentleman that we were talking about. And an agreement from a committee of movement disorder special that this seemed like a, a pretty good target to go for. So that's how we invented the targets right from the outset. So we started with a pilot study and its objective, we picked on people who's um, asking the questions is, can people with Parkinson's tell clinicians if they're out of target? Can clinicians tell if people with PD are, you know, are out of target? I mean, how good are the doctors and how good are the patients? And does it make a difference? So we call this the Victorian study, mainly because uh, we started doing studies in different states around Australia. But so we started here, and I know you know where Victoria is, but a lot of overseas people don't. So people with Parkinson's on four or more doses of levodopa, they were considered to be well controlled by both the patient and the doctor. So everyone thought things were really good. And there's no contraindication to changing the medications and they were managed by general neurologists, so it wasn't specialists who spend their life eat, living and breathing Parkinson's disease. So 86% of the people were outside the target range in this study. The movement disorder specialists, which included me, would have needed the PKG 30% of the time to tell whether there was a problem or not. And 8% of the people who were there, this is who are completely happy with where they were, we said actually, no, you're going to be better managed if you have one of the device-assisted therapies, duodopa, DBS, or something like that. So even though doctors and patients were entirely happy, 8% of these people were referred for DBS. So our first conclusion is that objective measurement is needed to find who needs therapy and more importantly, to trigger a therapeutic response. That is, that, that should we do something? So the next part of this question, and don't worry about all of the numbers here, because I'm just focused on this, is to ask the question is, well, if we did treat them and brought their scores into target, which was the next step we did here, was that worthwhile? Well, these two th things here are measurements of bradykinesia and the effect size, this number here, again, without going into the science, this is measuring how good did we do. It's the same as using the best therapies, introducing the best therapies we have in Parkinson's, which is not surprising. If they're out of target, we would expect that most of them would improve, and they improved according to the amount of therapy available. And so this is a significant improvement, and I won't bore you here, but. The problem with this is, because these people already had a good quality of life, we can't really improve their quality of life more. So they were already good. It's just that we were able to say, well, your UPDRS, or these measurements of bradykinesia were going to be better. So what we wanted to, and we'd also picked on a very narrow group. So we wanted to know what happens if we looked at the whole gamut of Parkinson's and looked at a population that represented all that you see in Parkinson's. So we went to this area of northwestern Tasmania where there was, we know that there were about 250 people with Parkinson's in this whole region. 
And um, again, we needed the map because the Americans kept calling this Tanzania. <laughs> and um, we wanted a study of all the people with PD in this discrete region and people who were managed with specialist nurses. So in this region, we put the, part, the PKG, the measured all of them right from the outset. In fact, there was, it wasn't quite all of them. There was a representative of about 50% of the population. And at the outset, 22% of them were already in the target range. 78% weren't. Of those 78%, 57% there was no reason why we couldn't treat them. 12%, right at the beginning we said you need device assisted therapy, that is DBS, duodopa, levodopa, right from the outset there was 12% that we knew that was going to be the best outcome. 9% we knew we couldn't treat them because of problems like um, blood pressure going too low or dementia. But 78% were outside of target. After treatment, this is the group that improved and 19% went on to have advanced therapies, that's DBS, duodopa, and a, a few more, 8% more, we said actually it probably isn't a good idea to treat you. So in terms of the proportion improved, the total improvement, it's 61%. We're now at 48% in the target range by increasing 26% in there. There was 16% we couldn't get into target without producing side effects, but they still had an improvement and 19% went on to have DBS or duodopa. So again, this is a graph. I don't want you to look at all of the things, but what I do want you to look at is the PDQ39. That's the quality of life, 34% improvements. MOCA, which is a measurement of cognition, there was about a 10% improvement. And these other measurements of quality of life also improved. So that's a fairly important endorsement that First conclusion, objective measurement is needed to find out who needs therapy, to trigger a therapeutic action. The second in conclusion is the objective measurement results in a meaningful improvement. That is, it's not just the doctor looking back and saying, well, that's a very fine thing that I did. It's actually the patient telling us, and, and I feel better. That was worthwhile, and that's an important outcome because that's the sort of thing that Medicare, your taxes at work, is willing to fund. And that's why that matters. Now, the problem with these is that, first of all, they were pilot studies and they were not randomised. And importantly, some of the doctors, a lot of the people doing it were doctors like me, who were deeply involved with developing the PKG. So even if we went into there, and I assure you we tried as, possible to, as much as possible to be fair-minded, there's still the possibility that there would be biases and in what we did. So this comes to the next stage, which is the advertisement for tonight, if you like, is that this is a treat-to-target study where we're now wanting to use objective measurement to guide the therapy to target in a randomised way and we're randomising the doctors, not the patients. And we're trying to recruit about 200 patients into a group of doctors who are using their clinical skills plus the PKG to try and get you to target and another group where they're using your cl their clinical skills to treat them to the usual standards of care and the outcome will be to compare the scores of quality of life and the decisions, rate of decisions at the end of the study. So basically asking, do people think that they were better off if they were treated using targets and measurements than if they were used at, measured using just normal standard of care? Now the outcome depends on the choice of therapy, so we train both arms, or we're training both arms in clinical management, and we're training them both to look for um, 
options for best therapy, for side effects and for contraindications. So we're training both sides to do it as best as they can. The only difference is we're using treatment. Now the participating sites of the Movement Disorder Fellows at these hospitals, Royal Melbourne, Sunshine, Shepparton, St Vincent's, Westmead, Royal Adelaide, Royal Brisbane. So there's a lot of royals in there and a lot of them have movement disorders, but we're using places like Shepparton and Sunshine and Royal Hobart because they don't have movement disorder specialists. So we're trying to keep a representation of the sorts of care that people with Parkinson's had. Now we started enrolment in June 2018 and we have 100 people involved already. And that first part of the study will be completed in December this year in about a month. And we're looking to increase this enrolment for 200. So stage two is enrolling now and we'd be very keen if you would be able to tell people in your acquaintances who have Parkinson's to think about this or even yourself if you have Parkinson's. So who can participate? Well, first of all, you've got to have Parkinson's. Secondly, there's an age limit, 59 to 75, taking four or more doses of levodopa. That's Kinson, Matapass, Tolevo, and be able to travel to a study clinic. So one of those places that we spoke about up there most of the, if since we're in Melbourne, you'll be talking about mainly the Melbourne sites. You may not be able to participate if you've had deep brain stimulation or taking duodopa or apomorphine, have low blood pressure or hallucinations or a problem with your thinking memory or planning. So we would measure those sorts of things and go through those. So, I've talked about the things that are involved already. You need to visit, may need to visit a clinic at least on three occasions. So the doctors, first of all, will assess you one way or the other using a standard visit to a neurologist. Um, but you may need, and then they would make some changes in therapy and you may need to come back quite a few times. On average, it's about three, but sometimes it can be even up to seven. That's very, very rare. It's mostly about three times. Clinics are all those sites we've talked about. Before each visit, you'll need to wear a PKG for a week before each visit. There will be formal tests of uh, cognition and uh, your actual performance at Parkinson's disease, and that's at the beginning and at the end. And those will be detailed questionnaires at the beginning and the very end of the study. And your medications may be changed, and we think it's probably, we think not that you, may wish to, we think it's probably a good idea to tell your treating neurologist that you're going to participate and have a chat about it. So if you wish to register, and I'll put this up again at the end of the talk so it's sitting there for a while, online, this is our preferred version. Next one is this, but if you're not up with the electronic method, uh, a phone number is okay, but we would really prefer those two so that we're kind of catch each other in a way that can be um, part of the study. Now, th that's, I'm going to want to leave time for questions, but I just thought that it, I'd like to talk about two separate things. One is, um, what's the, what else can be had by measurement? because we've talked all about the use of measurement to guide doctors to make better choices with the medications that you have. But it's as equally difficult if you're a scientist or a pharmaceutical company that's got a new drug and you're wanting to try and find out if it really works. You've got to measure the effect. And if you've got an objective measurement it's going to be more chance that you're going to be able to do it with a shorter trial. And the most common thing that happens is that you've got a drug that does work, but it doesn't actually get to market because the measurement actually failed. And half the time we think that it fails because the measurements are not good enough, not because the drug wasn't. And that's probably most important for some of the drugs that are going to modify disease rather than actually treat the symptoms because their effect is going to be slower and smaller and harder to pick up. 
It'll give us a better understanding of what PD is. And we know from other therapies as measurements improved that it's led to an understanding of are there different types of Parkinson's that progress differently and therefore might need different ways of treating them. Do they respond differently to the medications that are available and you can understand that and tease them out by understanding the therapy better, the medications and the measurements better. We know that this is true, particularly in the hematological world, but as we've got better and better at measuring, we know that that's actually the usual pathway that follows. Now, measuring disease progression is going to be a really important thing if we're going to have treatments that actually modify disease. Using the PKG, we are fairly certain that we can measure wearing off. We are also pretty certain, and this is a study we're underway, that looking at the rate of change of wearing off from the outset of the disease is a pretty good marker of how the terminal loss is progressing in the brain. We know that we can measure wearing off even right out to eight hours and nine hours. I showed you examples up there earlier of wearing off after three hours. But right at the diagnosis, we know that you can measure wearing off at about eight hours and we have evidence to show that you can show that change occurring in an individual. Because we haven't got disease modifying drugs, we don't know yet whether that can actually be modified and whether that's a useful thing but there are disease modifying drugs that are just emerging at present and this gives us an opportunity to test whether that's the case. It will be just as important to find early Parkinson's and it will be essential to slowing or halting the disease if we can measure it and therefore find people who are really in the very early stages. And more importantly, I think there's going to be better measurements than even the PKG. I hope there is, because that's going to mean that we can easily be even better at finding early disease and modifying that progression. The last thing is I thought you might like to understand a little bit about the pathway to where we got to now, the fact that it took us 30 years. So I'm going to be very quick on this. In the 1980s, accelerometers had just become available. They were big things. They were about um, that size, not the th easily fitting into your mobile phone, and they had a long cable. And we asked, well, could we use it to measure Parkinson's? And the answer was, we couldn't. And a lot of other people were trying at the same time. But in 1990, we asked, well, could we use accelerometers and pattern recognition algorithms, that is, things like handwriting detection and face recognition software? The answer was, we found over about uh, 10 years or so that, yes, we could. And we could turn that into the algorithms very much similar to the ones that we've just been talking about before. Our problem was that we had no funds for developing this further. Now remember at this time, there were no mobile phones, no lithium batteries, no internet. So we were trying to develop things right at the stage where these processes were going and it was expensive. So 2000 to 2007, we were trying without grants to build our own loggers. And it wasn't until we were able to get venture capital money that we were able to build the proper loggers to, build, to do the validation studies to show that building over the long term that it would really work. So this is the first version that was filled full of batteries, big <laughs> D-sized batteries. And that was our logger and the wires up running up the sleeve. 2009, it was getting smaller, but it was still pretty complicated. And this was the uh, next version, which um, we used for really quite a long time. And even though it did look a little bit like the sort of thing from a prison release scheme uh, log <laughs> system. And this is the current version. So I'm not going to um, take too much longer, but um, at present we've developed the algorithm. We got regulatory approval from the TGA, the FDA and the CE mark and experts agree that it works. We're beginning to show that it improves outcomes 
and, it, and the studies now that I've talked about and our plan now, and what we're trying to do all of this is to be able to convince the insurers that this would then be able to be paid and make it readily available for people in routine care. So at present, places like the UK, the Nordics and the Netherlands, uh, their insurance companies are actually been convinced that they would pay for it. We're nearly there in Germany. We have a code in the US and now the work is trying to com convince the insurance companies and studies like the one I just told you are necessary. And uh, more than 40,000 measurements have been done around the world. So I'll leave that slide up there and answer any questions as we go on from here. <laughs>